Welcome to all of you. Thank you to be here. I would like to introduce uh, Farah Daly of the New York Times that is, she's going to moderate this uh, conference and, and I hope you can enjoy because each time we do each time we do a conference, we do a solo show, sorry, we do a solo show, we have a conference to introduce Italian artists and and the, 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 the deep meaning of the of what the artists want to say. So uh, I introduce Farina Yirik, she's here with us. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you. I hope you hear me. Um, yes? Yes. My voice carries well. Um, so this uh, ex exhibition, as you can see uh, all around you, is devoted to Afro Basaldella. Uh, it's, he's an artist whose works um, are very unique and he was himself very much one of a kind among Italian artists. There was, of course, the matter of his first name. Um, Sorry, there was the matter of his uh, first name, Afro, which was given to him by his patriotic Italian parents when Italy colonized uh, territories in Libya. So that's really why, where this extraordinary name comes from. And um, there was also his art, which was, as you can see looking around you, it was not really one thing or another. Uh, I think uh, the art historians and specialists I have near me here will explain better, but um, it sort of sat somewhere between abstraction and figuration. Yes, they do look abstract, but there are actually some fragments of human figures or evocations of human figures and emotions in them. And so therefore he was kind of a, very much a genre onto himself. Uh, he was so handsome and so elegant that uh, they called him Il Principe, his friends did. And uh, he was kind of princely also in, in his um, in his manner, he, he lived in great style. I think at one point he rented a castello from a countess, and uh, and then uh, there was also the matter of his uh, address in Rome, which was uh, Via Marguta uh, near the Spanish Steps, which is of course, as those of us who are Romans or close to Rome know, the also the address of Federico Fellini. So the works of uh, Afro Gazaldella are today uh, in the collections of um, America's most important museums. Um, they are in MoMA, they are in Guggenheim, and they're also in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Because he spent quite a lot of time in the United States where he had a very dynamic art dealer by the name of Catherine Viviani. Viviana. Yeah. Viviana, sorry. And uh, so there is a very large painting of his also uh, in the headquarters of UNESCO in Place Fontenoy in Paris. It is an absolutely enormous wall-sized painting and it is one of the few modern um, works of modern art that are in UNESCO commissioned and uh, celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. It was painted 60 years ago exactly. So this is a painter who at the end of the 1950s was at an absolute pinnacle in the world of art. And yet somehow today when we say the name Afro, that name has less recognition than it once did. So that really is the question that we're going to try to kind of elucidate um, with the, the three specialists I have uh, sitting near me, if we compare to someone like Lucio Fontana, or Alighiero Boetti, or Alba, uh, uh, Burri, you know, th these are artists who are better known than Afro. And uh, it's kind of a mystery that someone who was being commissioned by UNESCO to do a huge, huge wall painting, and someone who is in the collections of MoMA and the Met and uh, was collected by some of America's most important collectors, should have kind of achieved a, a kind of a, a, a state of um, less less name, uh, sort of smaller name recognition. So anyway, um, I turn to my first speaker, Marco Mattioli, director of the Fondazione Archivio Afro in Rome. Um, I wanted uh, this conversation to be kind of somewhat biographical, to have a little, to begin with, a, a timeline of the life of Afro, which each period, with each period sort of described by uh, our speakers, and then we will open it up to discussion. And by the way, I encourage you to get some questions ready. Um, it really needs to be an interactive session for it to work for me. Uh, Marco, could you please tell us a little bit about the childhood of of, of Afro, his his early years, his adolescence, and um, 
Yeah, I mean, where did you grow up? So, so I don't want to be so boring about this geographical note, but it's important, I suppose, to to understand the artist, how he start to be successful in life. He he born in 1912, and he was a very simple family. Um, they was decorator. They do, you know, marble fake or uh, trompelet and something like this. They they have a simple there were house, life. House but but Afro start to live here uh, in this contest, and so brave art from the beginning of his life. And uh, he won't really want to be successful, so, and he starts to expose very early. At 16 years old, he has his first show, and then he 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 be graduated in Venice. So he began in contact with all the great artists of the, the area, and so people were on his he he brave art from the beginning. And when he had occasion, he go with uh, a foundation called Marangoni, helped him to go to Rome uh, to know there was Scuola Via 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 Cavour at the time, where there was Maffei, Antonietta Raphael, and he started like a figurative artist, an academic artist. After this, he began to have some recognition he started very early to be exposed at Milione in Milan. Milione was a very famous gallery for, that, for all the floors he had disappeared. <laughs> and after he came back to Rome, he understand Rome was the place to be, uh, I suppose, and uh, entering in contact with Corrado Cali, a Jewish artist, and, uh, and this gallery is called La Cometa, um, promoted by uh, another figure is called Pecci Blanc, Mimi Pecci Blanc. And, uh, and from, from this kind of day, he started to be exposed to Quadriennale di Roma. Quadriennale di Roma was another great, important show place to be and in nineteen thirty six he's participated to be in Venice. <coughs> so but uh, a lot so of So can success. you talk a little bit about it, can you describe him beyond, you know, the, the, the kind of um, uh, you know stages of his life, you know, what, what kind of a young man was he? Um, was he extremely gifted in school? Was he his talent noticed? He is very talented at the time. And he he looked at art like a very really work. So he he started in the morning to work and to paint and and in the in the evening. In the mean, he had to earn money in some in some yeah. way. So he take commission for moral frescoes or something like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially in the thirty eight, uh, he uh, he started to have private commission. Uh, the, the, the gallery, the municipal gallery of Udine, it's uh, it's uh, the, it's, a, it's a, the old house of a private commitment who do where Afro did uh, decoration inside. A lot of there's a so he room. kind of did some decorating himself uh, to start with, or at least yes. uh, intervened inside interiors before becoming a painter on canvas. Absolutely, yeah. He especially in the Rodi. Uh, Rodi, the, the Greek island, <coughs> in the 38 was part of the Italian government because there was the Rhodes. war Italy, Turkey, Rhodes. Yeah. And uh, he will be um, encouraged to do some fresco. If you go to the casino now, already now, <laughs> you can find in the restaurant side this big, big fresco of Afro. And it's in, on the island of Rhodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, uh, nice. So. Yeah. And, and so then he came back to Milan. He had, in Milan, uh, with Barbara, we were talking yesterday. Yeah. He, he earned money making portraits of private collection, and he earned a lot of money. And so, uh, friends told, joking with him, he said, uh, You have a butler and a house with white gloves. So he's a little bit successful. He believed a lot in himself. Yeah, I mean, he became successful, as we were discussing yesterday, <coughs> um, quite early on, because he was very good at. A pinpointing people who might help help him in his career, and he was also an elegant man, so I guess it helped, you know, um, give him yes. success quite early on. And I suppose he started making money early on. Um, and then when we reach the period of, uh, I suppose, the nineteen, uh, sorry, the, the 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 war years, the immediate post-war years, he started experimenting with cubism, and I wanted 
you, Barbara Dudi, to, to explain this to us. Barbara is a professor at the Accademia di Belle Arti of Florence, and uh, she knows a great deal about this man. Um, so tell us a little bit about why he suddenly started doing cubism. Um, when cubism had been done decades earlier by Picasso and Brown yes. in Paris. Yes. Uh, yes, after we have to, um, to think about the Italian situation after the war. Afro went back to Venice during the war. He was wounded during in Albania. He fought in Albania and then he was wounded and then he went back to Venice. And in Venice he got married. He married um, a very nice woman who supported him. And uh, at the well, end she of the war, she was a scholar. No? She was a scholar and she could speak English. That was a, a rare thing for those years because nobody in Italy was speaking English. Everybody was speaking French. French culture was the reference point for Italian intellectuals. So the fact that Maria could, Maria was the name of his wife, could speak English was a, a point of really rare and um, very important for Afro because when they came, came back to Rome after the war, where Afro had maintained his studio in Via Marcutta 94, um, they, uh, um, Afro wanted to, uh, to become an avant-garde painter. He didn't want to uh, stay tied to uh, this traditional painting, uh, the painting that was, has been inspired by Titian, Tintoretto, and all the Venetian painting. Uh, during the years of his um, f formation and uh, his, uh, uh, well, the years of school. So um, he wanted to be, he wanted to look around him, look outside Italy, and you know, in Rome, uh, the years after the war, uh, there was this atmosphere very vibrant, and everybody wanted to reconstruct. The, the world. Uh, Italy was, has been destroyed by the war, so everybody was mm, now had a, a new, like a new fever. Uh, they wanted to build another country, a country with, that had to be uh, modern, that had to look outside Italy because uh, after 20 years of the regime, uh, they have been close to the international culture. Yes, and they were close to something like Cubism and Picasso and all that, and kind of like really passed um, yeah. Italy by, which yes. is why the time artists... All the other guards, you know, uh, yeah. not just Cubism, but also Surrealism. Yeah. Uh, the only avant-garde we had in Italy was the Futurism, but it was really cut off because they had been connected to the fascism. So after the war, nobody, the artists in particular, could say that they are inspired by Futurism because, you know, the second uh, phase of Futurism was really connected to fascism uh, with Marinetti. Yes, of so uh, they had to look at, some, at something, at a painting outside Italy that was, uh, in a way, uh, accepted uh, in the new uh, art scene that was uh, flourishing in those years. Uh, I mean, after the war, 1945, 1950, uh, when all the cultural uh, affairs, if I can say that, uh, has been um, in the hands of the Communist Party. Uh, you know, we had, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to go out uh, on the path, but um, I have to say that uh, the Communist Party was really, they had an hegemony because they had all the cultural initiatives in their hands. Well, let's go back to so, the issue of him yes. kind of becoming uh, so, a Cubist painter. Uh, so Afro, with other painters in that period, wanted to be, uh, wanted to look outside Italy and to uh, try to um, to start a new tradition, a new modern tradition. So he decided to look at Cubism, because Picasso was a communist artist, yeah. and he he was the one who had um, changed the way the, the the way of thinking, the space in painting. He invented another way of thinking the space in painting. 
and not more the perspective space, not more the three-dimensional space, but the flat space, yeah. the flat but surface. Yeah. So Afro started to uh, uh, paint as a with this uh, neo cubist manner. Yeah, and I mean also, um, by the way, parenthesis, was he himself a communist? Uh, no, not at all. Not really. Not, not at, at all. all. <laughs> no, because uh, you know the uh, there was a diktat from the communist party for the arts. Uh, the painter had to be engaged. They had to be involved in politics, and they had to paint figurative painting uh, with, uh, I don't know, peasants and workers and right. miners. Not interesting. <laughs> Not very interesting. So, um, um, yeah. Can I get you, Barbara, quickly to tell us a little bit also about the decade that followed and his first trips to the United States? Because he. Sure went to America quite yeah, quickly, sure. and that really is the key to his sure. future success. Uh, the problem was that in Italy there was no market for art. Italy was a poor country. Yes, they, everybody was trying to uh, uh, get out of this condition, but there were no money. So Afro and his wife uh, thought that the best way was to look at America <laughs> and to find a, a market in the United, in the United States. <laughs> So they started to Afro frequented the, the American Academy in Rome, which was the outpost of the Americans in Rome. The American Academy that was open for the first time at the beginning of the 20th century reopened after the war in 1948. So Afro could become friend uh, with uh, Patrick J. Keller, who was the director of the American Academy for two years, and then he went back to the United States and uh, became the director of the Albright Knight um, Art Gallery of Buffalo, and then of Lawrence Roberts, and then he met Philip Gaston. So uh, we have to say that there were also a um, huge community of Americans in Rome. They, the writers, painters, intellectuals, they loved to, to, to stay in Rome because Rome was an easy city. I don't blame them. I lived there for three years. <laughs> <laughs> And, also because and these, these, two gem, these two are, are you're Roman as well. Yes, I'm Roman. Roman and Roman, so it's, <laughs> Rome is very well represented today. Then we have Venice no, represented, right. and we yes. will get to Venice in a minute. Um, so, Barbara, so, can you tell us a little bit so, about his trip to so America? He, uh, uh, no, through this, uh, when, he, when he went to America, what yeah, happened? Yes, so uh, through this uh, friendship with Americans, uh, Afro could uh, meet. Um, Catherine Viviano, who was a dealer in New York. She had been the assistant of Pierre Matisse um, in New York. And Pierre Matisse, the was son, the of, son Henri Matisse. of Henri Matisse. Yes. Uh, and a very prominent dealer. Yeah. yeah, and he promoted French art in the United States. So Catherine Viviano uh, wanted to open her own gallery and to promote Italian artists in the United States. <laughs> so she came uh, to Italy and Afro could meet her and she opened the gallery in 1950 and she did first a group exhibition and then um, in the spring of 1950 the first solo Afro show in New York. Because that first show in 1950, I understand, sold quite well, right? He, he was in a group show. And yes, first he was in a group show and, and then did uh, very well, so she gave uh, the The painting by Afro were the, the most, most admired. admired. Yes. Um, so this is New York, New York 1950, by the way. Yes. This is New York 1950. Yes. When the abstract expressionism was not uh, already established. Uh, they were still uh, went to the bar, the Cedar Bar in 10th Street. <laughs> they yeah. got drunk, and they, yeah. and they were somebody of them was still a surrealist. Yeah. Uh, okay. So so, so then, uh, then what so happened Afro, after the solo show? Then yes. Uh, so Afro uh, had this solo show, and he went to New York for the first time, and he made a trip all around the states. But uh, he probably he didn't look at the American artists. He went to visit directors of museums and collectors because uh, Catherine Viviano wanted to, um, to bring the European and the Italian culture in New York. She didn't want that Afro uh, starts copying American art. That's it. 
And, and so from, from 1950 on, uh, Afro had um, uh, solo exhibitions every two years in New York for 20 years, between 1950 and 1970. And he had a special, special relation with uh, Catherine Bibiano. And she had a, an exclusive relation with Afro. Afro couldn't sell uh, any painting in, in the United States without the permission of <laughs> Catherine because she wanted to uh, maintain a high level of collectors and she could sell a painting to the MoMA, a painting to the Guggenheim Museum, a uh, painting to yeah. different museums mm -hmm. and to great collect collectors right. as the Barnes. Um, mm -hmm. I would like uh, now to, to uh, ask uh, something of, of, um, of uh, Philip Rylands, art historian and uh, emeritus director of the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice, which he ran for many, many years, and I'm sure all of you have visited. Um, can I ask uh, the, the, the audience to, to be silent because the acoustics are such that we can hear you? Um, uh, the question that I wanted to put to you, Philip, and I, I can hear, excuse me, can you keep your voice down? Sorry. Um, the question that I wanted to put to you, Philip, is um, Barbara was just alluding to the fact that, uh, that, that uh, Afro was in America, but he wasn't really per sort of absorbing American art. Can I get you to talk about that? Because when we had a chat yesterday, you said, well, actually, his art was not very American. Can I get you to sort of expound on that? I, I could draw attention to the subtitle of this exhibition, which is called The Makings of an Abstract Expressionist. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't say the makings of an American abstract expressionist. I think you have to allow the fact that America doesn't have the exclusive on um, the term abstract expressionist. Recall, remember, it goes back to 1917. It was a reference to Kandinsky. Afro's art can be explained exclusively within the tradition of the European avant-garde, at least until the late 1950s. It's all there. It begins with Matisse and Derain, uh, and Barbara has referred to the vogue for Cubism. It was called, actually called new Neo-Cubism in the late 1940s in Rome. It all comes out, out of that. And all, there were you know, handles like this were circulating. And in fact, Mirko, his brother, <coughs> very talented sculptor brother, uh, used to talk about abstract surrealism, uh, which is sort of, sort of the way to capture even American art in the late 1940s, early 50s. Remember, that, the term abstract expressionism didn't become applied to um, the New York School until 1952. And I think the fact is that we have to imagine a kind of sense of superiority on the part of the European Afro with respect to what was, what was going on in New York. Uh, if, if I could digress for a second and to look at the paintings actually hanging around you. Yes. So there's a very intriguing development. This talk about neo-cubism is evident in the last picture on, on the side wall down there. It's called Spirito Guida. It's going to be hard for you to look at it now, but nonetheless there it is, representative of that later, late moment in the late 1940s, but I think inspired by his brother Mirko, who also uh, switched to a cubist style as did many other artists in the period. Bedevas, uh, Maso, Pizzinato, and Friedman Ischitz, I can think of, all doing a neo cubist style. And he uses that to modernize his, his, um, his work, to reject what he'd been doing all through the 30s, which is a kind of murky um, expressionist style based on the squalor. The Idea Cavour, which uh, um, Marco mentioned, uh, the Scuola Romana, which merges with the Scuola di Idea Cavour, uh, the Tonalists, and so on, various things which were going on, which were all about personal expression through rather murky still lifes and landscapes and cityscapes. He kind of comes to a, a dead end on that in the mid 40s and switch and, and cubism was for him a, a great release. In the late 40s and indeed in the first show in 1950, I should mention that the, that neo-cubist style was very specifically <laughs> what you would have found in MoMA's great 1949 exhibition called 20th Century Italian Art. I mean, it, it, as a signal of, of a rather rapid acceptance of his work in the United States. He was included in the 20th century survey of Italian art that um, uh, Alfred Barr, who was there? There was another 
the Caribbean. Uh, and that's why James Wall Sobe did. They toured Italy, they found Afro, and they included him in that show. The 1950 Viviano show shows him loosening up on Achilles' work. And in fact, there's a picture on the more or less opposite called Tales from Gascony, in which uh, line and shape and form begin to detach themselves from that rather compact synthetic cubism manner. Um, I should also mention that there was an Italian bit going on here with uh, an evocation of Giorgio de Chirico in the content and the, and the sort of vertical format of some of those neo-cubist works. So through, through, through the early 50s, the work is beginning to loosen up. And you come to a magnificent work like the red one here of, I think, 1955, The Boy with Turkey, which is actually um, probably, I don't know, I would say a masterpiece from his greatest moment, yeah. greatest period. The mid-1950s is when I think Afro really triumphs as, as a superbly creative, original, an accomplished artist. And a painting with the same title as the one in, in MoMA. There are two versions, exactly. MoMA has a version, they're both reddish like this, or hot red. And what it represents <laughs> is what I've described in the catalogue as, as, as a memory of farmyard slaughter, probably an anguished memory of little Afro. Because it's uh, called Boy with Turkey. Turkey, it's strangling it's a the turkey because well, they wanted to hang it for dinner or something. I mean, there was, there's a conflict going on there, you can see quite clearly the forms of the turkey on the right hand side. Yeah, the boy is strangling the turkey, by the way. <laughs> the boy is strangling the turkey. Remember, distressing. Right. And that may be the hot red, because he's actually rushing. I mean, actually, you know, it's not the anguish of the moment. Blood. Blood. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think of that. Um, uh, and here we have a man who's remembering things and treating them in an abstract, a quasi abstract manner, not fully abstract. So in 1952, when for the, almost the only occasion he joins a group, he, become, he is one of the eight painters of a, of a group, uh, understandably called the Group of the Eight, the Gruppo degli Otto, were eight artists who showed together at the Venice Biennale with uh, critical support from a certain Lionello Venturi, and he was very anxious to figure out that this wasn't pure abstraction, nor was it pure figuration. This was, these were figures treated in an abstract manner. Uh, and the abstract surrealist tag that I mentioned before comes in here because this is, a, this is a man who is drawing on his memory. I don't say subconscious or unconscious because I don't really believe in those things in, the, in, in this context. I think it's more about semi-conscious and conscious memories of his childhood. Can, uh, we, um, can yeah. we also get you to sort of describe how um, this artist uh, at his peak in the 1950s is commissioned by UNESCO to produce this giant canvas. Talk to us a little bit about that. But Barbara has described in the catalogue and ably just now, this increasing success. Yeah. 1955 is included in a, in a very important show at MoMA called The New Decade, along with a very small number of other Italians and all kinds of Europeans. It was a great distinction to be included, and that's so distinct that he was chosen to be a jury member in 1955 for <coughs> the Carnegie Prize. Uh, in 1956, he wins the prize at the Biennale, Venice Biennale. So this kind of growing success leads, in 1957, to his nomination to be one of 12 artists, including the most distinguished avant-gardists in Europe, to decorate the UNESCO building with a 27-foot mural. And a whole essay is dedicated 27 to 27-foot mural, and by the way, it's all on canvas, canvas. you were saying canvas. to me. It's not painted on the wall, it is one huge chip. Canvas. I mean, that is quite. If, if you've seen Pollock's mural of 1943, it's the same yeah. size and same same medium, oil and canvas. So there, there he is in the company of Picasso, Art, uh, Tamayo, all kinds of. And the, and the author of the essay on this, and Montfort, in the catalogue, points out that he was the only non Parisian, really. And it's true that Matter was not a Parisian, but all the others were somehow associated with the Parisian school of painting. I would say the Col de Paris, because that's too, definitive, too limiting. But Afro was the only kind of outsider. So it was an enormous distinction. There's Henry Moore doing his uh, sculpture in front of him, doing a mural. He painted in 1957, not in Italy, but he was a visiting professor <coughs> at Mills College in Oakland, California. He kind of liked being a teacher. He, he, he enjoyed being in the States. He had a huge studio. And for several months, uh, he furiously <coughs> prepares a mural scale picture. He was used to doing murals. He'd done them in the 30s, as Martha pointed out. Murals were something he could cope with. It was in the Venetian tradition, and he makes this splendid sort of overall tonality of grey mural, the Garden of Hope, it was called. Yeah, 
And then also, just basically to move on a little bit uh, in his life, uh, I believe he loses his wife uh, tragically, and um, this is a cause of great, great pain and suffering for him. His health starts to deteriorate, and I believe also in the early 1970s he loses his sculptor brother Mirko, and this is all another absolutely devastating blow. So we lose this artist quite early on, you know, he, he passes away in the 1970s. 76. So, um, Philip, what happens? What, what is the process by which someone who is in the UNESCO headquarters, in MoMA, in the Met, then suddenly um, has less name recognition in the decades since? Forgive me, for I'm going to steal a moment just to continue this thing about the paintings actually in the gallery here, to understand how the decade we, of the we, 1950s we, evolved. We, we will come to that. Um, yeah. We'll come to that later? Yeah. Okay. I think the real explanation for him slipping from, uh, from view somewhat, from being the Italian painter in the United States and in Paris, apparently, in, in the 1950s, because, because, as we know, in the 1960s, the avant-garde multiply, internationalize, accelerate, breakneck speed. Everything starts to happen, including in Italy. You know, 1959 is Azimuth with Castellani, Bonalumi, and Manzoni doing extraordinary things. The origins of conceptual art go back to that, and um, the extra flex canvas. Everything starts to change. Then um, in America, it's obvious minimalism, pop art, uh, and so on. The, the survival of this kind of painting is uh, with Greenberg's color field and lyrical abstraction. Uh, but the avant garde, the locus of where the avant garde, the cutting edge was, is stolen away from pure painting and, and figurative sculpture. And I say pure painting because that's actually a phrase that was used by American critics like Dory Ashton, who talked about uh, um, Afro as possibly the purest painter of the, among the purest painters of the 20th century, pure painting. So his style was, you know, somewhat out of, not out he of fashion, with it. a little he, bit out of fashion. He insists on painting. Yeah. Incredibly accomplished works, the painting changes a little. Uh, emblematic is an encounter in 1959 in which Willem de Kooning borrows his studio for several months when he was on a, an adulterous holiday with Ruth Kligman. <laughs> in, uh, in Rome, right? In yeah, Rome, Rome. Yeah, in Rome. Uh, but he sticks with it, the style evolves, it's incredibly linear and coherent, uh, even down to the last works, in, in my view. But, it, but the avant-garde is no longer about painting. All you have to do is track all those great events in the 1960s. Rauschenberg winning the Grand Prix of the Biennale, primary structures of the Jewish Museum, uh, Andy Warhol's soup cans at um, the Ferris Gallery in, in Los Angeles, and all these things really sort of leave a notion of, of avant-garde artists belonging to painting and sculpture as such, and they leave it behind. So it's worth being in pole position all through the 50s. He's overtaken by other tendencies, which take with them the collectors, dealers, and critics, uh, and museum directors in, in the 1960s. I think that's the main explanation. The, the, the end of his life does come rather early. Yeah. And as you mentioned, he loses his brother, who, to whom he was devoted. Mirko was in 68. In 68, was, was a little bit older, um, and they were really Castor and Pollux between them. Uh, and uh, then the first stroke or heart attack in 1970, and another in 1976, uh, and so on. So, so in a way, you must understand the, la the very last works also in that context, the works of the 1970s, which you can see down the stairs, yeah. as uh, works of a kind of old age style, even though he was only in his 60s, I think. Mean, born mm -hmm. in 1912. Yeah. So how, what was he in 76? He was in his 60s, 60s, 60s yes. left yeah. very young. Um, I wanted to point out that um, with us this morning we have the grandson of Afro. I wonder, is, his name is also Afro. Could I please ask you to stand up? <laughs> hey, <laughs> Buongiorno. Hi. Buongiorno. So we have a, 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 a flesh and blood member of the family and another member of the family here because your <laughs> spouse is the daughter, uh, sorry, yeah. the granddaughter. Uh, uh, grandson in law. You, you, he's the grandson-in-law sitting next to me here. He's a, he's a no. Yes, it's very nice to have uh, family members among us this morning. So before I open it up to questions, and I really do encourage you to, to ask um, uh, whatever you like of our three panelists, I thought Perhaps I would let you now, Philip, give us a little overview of what we have here in the gallery, and also perhaps just to briefly tell us what's in the catalogue. 
at, at my shoulders and straight in front of you is a fantastic a masterpiece called Portrait of Tese. And this mark, this, the, the difference between this and the boy strangling the turkey gives you the sense of the shift in the late 1950s from what I... I so from this painting here, from, to, the one that one, me. to that one. Around about 1957, we find him talking to this same critic who espoused the, the Gruppo del Yotto in 1952, Leonello Venturi. And Leonello Venturi has to write a text for a book on Italian painting, and he asks for some notes from, um, from Afro. And Afro, who rather rarely expressed himself on this stuff, said, you know, I'm getting tired of all these memories and all this unconscious evocation of my childhood. So it's, it's, I want now paintings to begin to speak for themselves. He wanted to kind of hand over from his own, the projection of his own person, expressionism, to uh, the self-reflexivity, sorry about the ugly word, but somehow that helps, helps you capture the idea of, an, of, the uh, of the work of artists autonomous, as the brush strokes and the colors and the shapes all beginning to emerge from the work of art autonomously as he worked on them. So by subtracting the subjective element, he gave the objectivity back to the paintings. And this is much closer at this point to American abstract expressions. And I think I've, I've suggested it should be called his work from 57 onwards, possibly precipitated by the huge effort to make the UNESCO mural, becomes um, different, slightly different in technique. It's more brushy. You can't quite call it action painting, something which he'd rejected before. He said, Pollock, you know, these guys, they're just, well, it's only about rapidity of making. That's actually his phrase. They're just in a hurry. Uh, whereas you should think about art. Was, and a work like The Boy with the Turkey is much more meditative. It's slow art. Uh, whereas this gets a bit quicker. And so when de Kooning comes, he'd met him years before, but when de Kooning comes and he himself does, in the studio of of uh, Afro in Rome, a series called the Rome series, in you know, really brushy black Franz Klein kind of pictures. Black and, and white Rome, it's called the series, it's called Black, black and, and White, white Rome. Rome. There we go. Uh, that must have been a confirmation of this tendency not to sort of start hurling the paint around, but to give much more, to make the brush stroke much more vivid. So when you see streaks in these paintings, they're not the cogitated lines of the early works. There are genuinely traces of the movement of the brush. It's and can I get you difference. briefly yeah. also to uh, just Tell us what we will see downstairs when we head down. So you said they were the are, later works. Um, and more of these, and then, and then at some point, I think to be pedantic almost, in about 1967-68, he reverts to his style of, of high, very careful, rather misty <laughs> memories in, in his pictures, at least to that manner. And then after that come much more compact images, which I consider an evolution still. But the edges harden, the shapes, the colors become uh, more uniform, uh, even opaque, and, then, and a different style emerges from about 1970 onwards, I think, yeah. mm -hmm. something like that, yeah. uh, a mark of which may have something to do with the biographical element, the fact that he was not well, that he was melancholy from the loss of his brother, you know, uh, Timor Mortis, uh, the sense of, sense of the brevity of life, they, they may constitute a kind of old age style. And can I get you, because this is a really wonderful catalogue um, led by Philip himself, uh, there's, there are writings by Philip and Barbara, uh, which I encourage you to, to look at. Um, Philip, can you just briefly give us an overview of what's in there? Um, yeah, the Afro bibliography is huge, but this is probably the, more, the most comprehensive publication in English, as well as Italian, uh, that's in print today. So if you want to know more about Afro, this is the book to get. Uh, it's got a long essay surveying, a long ish essay surveying the whole career by me. And, uh, and as you've understood, what really interested me was to try to get inside his skin and what he thought he was doing in painting figurative abstract art of this kind. So there's a message by me, then Barbara uh, discusses specifically the, the American aspect of his career, which is uh, probably one of the most important aspects, and that was his success. He had less success in Italy, strangely enough, than he did in, uh, in America. Uh, uh, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, is not a <laughs> And then uh, Anne Montford discusses specifically the mural. But then there are appendices, which were great fun. There's an anthology, a critical anthology, things he wrote, things others wrote about him in his lifetime and just afterwards, a description of his studio and, and so on. That text by Leonella Venturi. And, um, and then these letters, the these, like these letters. And um, fun letters taken from the archives, thanks to Marco Mattioli and Afro. 
Graziani here, here in, in, in the audience. And they give you an insight into what it meant to be Afro, it meant to be an artist at that time. There's a particularly fun sequence early on. In 1943, Afro in Venice, teaching at the Academia, I think. Yeah. Still had it in the studio in Via Margutta. And he thinks that Mirko, his brother, beloved brother in Rome, could benefit by having access to it. So he hands over the keys. He sends somebody down to Rome with the keys. Well, the person gives it to another artist, Ettore Colla, to give to Mirko. But Colla uh, gives it instead to Vedova and Turcato. <laughs> and they ransack the studio. <laughs> they go in there and they mess it up. Block the laboratory, <laughs> they steal his materials, they, they walk off with his boots, and even with a painting by Ottone Rosai. And so they behaved appallingly, and, uh, and Afro was horrified. He talks about them abusively in his letters, and he says these, these manigoldi, which we kind of translate as scound, scoundrels. So this, this, these guys were really poor, they hadn't got anywhere to paint. They were ruthless, they were, in a way, they didn't have any bourgeois morality to cope with being artists, of course. Uh, I don't say about that, but all artists, there's some here. Uh, in other words, I mean, there's this, this, this kind of aura of, you know, of, of making do of, po of, of poverty and difficulty in, in Rome in, in 1943-44. And eventually, you know, he threatens to report them to the police, and almost does. He gets the Rosai back, I believe, uh, possibly some of the materials. Turcato was apologetic and a bit sheepish about it. Very divided, I think. No. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really wonderful story. Can you hear me, by the way? Is this working? Yeah. 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 Um, I wondered if there were any questions from the audience at this point. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, could you, could you, I, could I you, two questions. Number one. Could you, no, excuse me. Could you introduce yourself? Please? Sure, I'm Brian Berger from New York. From New York? Yes. Are you an art uh, gallerist, a dealer, a, a curator? A, can I, I mean, where do you work? We own an Afro. You own an uh, Afro. Okay, great. A collector. Great. Two questions. Number one, uh, you alluded to the fact that in the 1960s, his popularity waned in America. I just wondered, what was the reaction of Catherine Viviano at that point? Did she, did she go out and try to aggressively re-promote him? Barbara, Barbara, she, do you want to take that question? Um, and the second one, just question, the yeah. second one on uh, the floor is, is there a catalog resume or is there going to be one? Or? Barbara did the catalog resume, <laughs> so she's the person to uh, answer. Yes, yes, there is the catalog resume of paintings uh, which I collaborate, collaborated in. And, uh, and there, there's also a catalog resume of drawings yeah, uh, till 1947. And I think it's gonna, they're working on, change. okay. The, the and we're second, working to the second part. To the second part. Uh, so there is, uh, as you can imagine, uh, it's not uh, really complete. I mean, uh, we're work, gonna work find, work in progress. Uh, yes, it's work in progress because sometimes a new painting comes out. <laughs> So, but then uh, to the question, but, uh, about, uh, to the question yeah, about you know uh, about the sixties, yes, yeah. about the sixties yeah. and the work of Catherine Viviano. Uh, well, uh, we have to say that uh, Catherine Viviano closed the gallery in 1970, but already in 1968 uh, she wrote to Afro and she said, "Now it's going to it's going to be very difficult to sell your paintings." As um, uh, Philip was saying uh, that the triumph of new, a new kind of uh, art was rising, like uh, minimal art, pop art, uh, and all these kind of things uh, were against painting. So Catherine Viviano did uh, many efforts, but it was getting uh, worse and worse uh, to sell Afro's painting after the mid-60s. Um, anyway, uh, the, the, the latest uh, group uh, exhibition of Afro was in 1966 in a museum, in the Sarasota Museum. So, uh, with, also with Gaston and Larry Rivers, who was a, a pop art artist. Uh, so, um, I mean, I think that Catherine Viviano did uh, a good job, but it was really getting yeah. difficult to, to sell yeah. Afro's painting during the 60s. Yeah. And what? he was also because, maybe I just add yes. a little yeah. thing, uh, that in a way during the 50s, the Afro's painting was really uh, one of a kind 
Instead, during the 60s, he was more influenced by the abstract, the American abstract expressionism and the gesture painting. So it was not so um, particular anymore. He was getting, you know, more... He was not so special anymore. It was not so special yeah, anymore. So. Yeah. Um, what I'd really like to hear from you, sir, is how you acquired this Afro painting and why. Do you want to come up? Can I bring the mic? I'm going to pass it over to my wife. Because Sure. Because her father. Uh, okay. Can, can we have a microphone um, so we can hear this lady? I wasn't the one who spoke up. <laughs> <laughs> I passed it on to her. It's really her picture. Um, do you Do you want to tell us just in a few words um, how this painting came into your uh, collection? You no, know, I think um, I found it in Catherine Stewart. Uh -huh. I think actually there was somebody that he knew in Rome. She also bought some art in Rome. Yeah. And um, and dealt with her over the years. I mean, they became great friends. I remember meeting her myself. And so we had several large canvases, but one in particular, which I was drawn to, which was a 1952 very large canvas with blacks and dark greens in it. And uh, I think my niece has another small one, and a few actually. We unfortunately, it were later pictures, but we did sell them. Um, so the collection that, that your family has is, is of Italian art, or uh, no? Uh, it's just no. my father collected a lot of Alberos and Gotti, American artists. But on a trip to Rome, I think he met this dealer, and then I uh, was introduced to Captain Viviano, and, uh, and loved loved to the art. It's very interesting, actually, to have these kinds of uh, uh, personal stories from from within, you know, from outside the panel. So thank you for that. Um, do we have any other questions from? Yes, please. Could I get you to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Joseph Bolin. I'm an artist, and my wife and I live in Africa. Um, Lucky you. <laughs> I was wondering if someone could speak uh, a bit further about the artistic relationship between the possible artistic relationship between de Kooning and Africa in those few uh, years. Um, I think there's more friendship. I think when, when de Kooning comes to Rome, he's really happy to be celebrated and welcomed and, and happy to have the use of, this, of the studio. And, I, and I, I think affinity, more than influence, is, is the, the right word to use about them. Um, there's, there's no doubt that um, Afro's paintings in the late 50s begin to look more de Kooning-ish. Um, but, but they never go that far. It's never all about action. It's the, the, the brushstroke may seem vivid and present, but it's been thought about before it's been applied. But, uh, Philip, is, is, is an example of that the one behind mm -hmm. you? Or? I believe it is. Port -a -port -is, is the title. Um, and so, I, uh, and, and by that time, Afro was well beyond influence as such. I think what it, it's just what, what determined his shift in 1957 towards more abstract expressionist painting in the American manner was really a, a sense of his own need to change to drop the heavy load of, of subjectivity that went into all the previous paintings, memories and so on. All those pictures down the wall on your right are called Encounter. We don't know who they, the encounter was between, but it was a meeting between presumably at least two people which must have stuck in his memory. A, a, a rendezvous uh, at night at a bar. I don't know what, what meeting is going on, but, it, but it's about something subjective and that, that vanishes in the, in the late 1950s. But I don't, I'm not aware that there was strong influence as such. Nevertheless, 1957 is the year when new American painting comes to Rome. The show, the traveling international show from Mo MoMA, which presents in, on a magnificent scale all the great artists of that generation. So the, so the a powerful impression of American art comes in the late 1950s and coincides. So in a way, it's an ineffable problem. As it always is, you know better than I how artists get influenced by things. But I, I think it's possible to explain the Kuh, um, Afro's evolution as an artist in purely internal, in purely, in purely on his own terms, in purely European terms, without American art, I think. Barbara, go ahead. Uh, what do you maybe, think? Yes, I think, no, I agree with you, but uh, I want to add a new thing, which is about the method. Probably uh, when Afro met de Kooning, when de Kooning came to his studio in Rome, 
he looked, uh, Afrokun looked at uh, the method of painting, the making of painting of the Kooning, which was much more direct. You know, for these paintings that you see here, Afro uh, proceeded uh, starting from a little like a doodle, and then he had colors, and then he arrived to a like a cartone for a fresco, like that one. Like the charcoal was on the, the, the far end of the, the wall. same size of the final <laughs> painting. So it was um, old kind of, yes, old master's procedure. Uh, instead, you know that uh, the Kooning, especially when he was in Rome, when he did this series of black and white Rome, he used to uh, paint directly. Um, the series uh, actually is a um, collage series. There are not painting on canvas but on paper and they are collage and they are cut and the shapes are cut and um, faced, faced on, a, on, the, on the surface and uh, after, the, after 1955, uh, 1960 also Afro started to paint in this way he abandoned the, the, the old master procedure and started to paint directly without doing a draw, a preparation drawing. So that I, I, I think that the friendship and the relation with the Kooning uh, provoke this uh, changing in his method. And uh, I want to uh, underline also the friendship uh, because there, there are some letters between Afro and the Kooning uh, in which the Kooning asked Afro to protect him uh, with a dealer in Rome. So uh, it was really a, a good friendship and a profound friendship. They, they were close. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask Marco uh, a question, and I think we're going to be wrapping up uh, soon after that. So if anyone has another question, we could go on for another maybe five minutes, Ursula, or yeah, yeah. five, ten minutes. But uh, I wanted to ask Marco, uh, to tell us a little bit about the, the foundation, the Archivio uh, Afro, which you manage in, in Rome. Yeah. What, what, is in, what is in that foundation? I imagine a lot of, several of the works in this show are coming from you. Uh, we have the address of more of the, uh, the, 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 the collector of the, of the picture in this show. Okay, so they're, they're, you contacted so the collectors of the show. We support the Naboni, and I have to thank you. So I want to do that thing. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Somewhere. Definitely. You need to, <laughs> to find this kind of picture, to, to make clear how he, his career, his uh, biographical evolution of the work. The foundation, we, we want to see the foundation like a living matter, something to create new aspect and show the different uh, I don't know, the, the layers. layers of the art as it means life. And this we can do it because we have a lot of materials, correspondence, photograph and publish that for the first time are here. Or in the catalog. And um, you know, we are like a little mice in the library to find something new, something interesting to to promote and to, to make understand how how, how was a, a very great successful man in life. Yes, and, and I think that he is um, a very prominent um, name on the art market, uh, definitely in Europe, certainly within Italy, he is, he is a very prominent name. Uh, uh, it's uh, something that obviously thanks to this exhibition, uh, which Ursula Casamonti, <coughs> the director of this gallery, has put on, uh, and thanks to the scholarship of of you in the catalog, um, we are going to perhaps you know reach other levels of of uh, recognition uh, also by the market because clearly art historical recognition he has it he's yeah. in the greatest museums in America yeah. and in UNESCO so uh, there is no problem about art no. historical no. recognition no. Um, you know and the market will will probably follow because as we know there is a an increasing <laughs> appetite uh, all over the world for for Italian art, and um, we have a great example um, here with us. So, so in terms of um, your daily um, activity, you you are looking to promote exhibitions, to promote uh, and the book, the, books. The, the idea of this exhibition starts from this book. Oh, when Michael and Ursula came to Rome two years ago, they want to do like a, a 
kind of coffee table book, really yeah. so fashion book, but at the same time something for researcher, for studying, for improve the, the figure of the art field after this time. About the market, yes, in Italy it's well represented. Uh, we're yeah. happy, quite happy. Not enough, but we're happy. I think so. There is some kind of can 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 go on, can can, can, grow, can grow up yes. very quickly. Yes, we also have in the room is uh, Michele uh, Casamonti, who is standing in the back, who is uh, the brother of Ursula and the director of Tornabuoni Paris. Uh, so these are both art historians as well as um, you know gallery directors. So they bring you know scholarship and, and uh, intellectual heft to the shows they put on. So. Um, uh, Yes, Barbara, please. Let's say thank you also to Mario Graziani. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. the president of the foundation. Mario president Graziani the is the, fa is the father of Afro. Of he's the of the the Archivio Afro and Fondazione Afro. Well, we have to explain who that is. Mario is the son of Afro and the father of the younger Afro who is with us here. So yes, he, he played a great, great big role. No, because uh, just a little... Um, saying that um, after the death of Afro, the market, also the market in Italy was going down. So it's, uh, we have to say Mario uh, started to um, uh, buy again many paintings and he uh, invented the archive, Afro's archive, and he was, I mean, he, he could um, he went to the United States and tried to gather all the paintings that were there and so I mean it's really we, deserves, we miss him. Uh, we miss him. Yeah. He should be here today. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So on so, that um, note, I think Barbara that we're going to conclude this panel. And uh, I wanted to really thank everyone for uh, being here today in such large numbers. Uh, it's really very nice to see you. Thank you to all who contributed from uh, the audience. And um, the speakers are here for chit-chat, questions, comments. Thank you very much. Thank you.